Uh, tr tr trust me, I'm only speeding uh, when I can get through the construction zones here in West Virginia. Yeah, uh, I will explain this. Where am I? Uh, not in Louisville, not in Baltimore, not yet. Uh, what requires less, 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 less explanation? This is the Hardcore Handicappers podcast. We are together again, whether you're watching or listening. Uh, we are licking wounds left over from Mystic Dan's 18 to 1 upset in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, maybe best left in the past, we continue our unrequited search for the undefeated handicapper. We press forward then with the 149th Preakness Stakes on Saturday at Pimlico in Baltimore. Mystic Dan will be there two weeks after he won by a nose at Churchill Downs in the Derby. Bob Baffert will be there after the Derby door was closed on him for the third year in a row. He has two horses trying for his record ninth victory in the Preakness. The heavy favorite, Muth. Seven other three-year-olds will line up with Muth and Mystic Dan in that mile and three sixteenths this weekend. Lining up for us are the hardcore handicappers in Las Vegas. He runs DraftKings. If you're watching, he's on the upper left. Uh, DraftKings Sportsbook, DK Horse, making his 42nd appearance on the RFRP. Yes, Johnny Avello, I'm counting. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm happy to be asked by Horse Race and Nation to speak on the second leg of the Triple Crown. Thank you, guys. Um, and, uh, you know, Ronnie, it wasn't a total disaster for me. The Derby, I actually used Mystic Dan. And so the exact, it was uh, good for me. So, you know, when we do this podcast, sometimes things will change a little as you get near the end of the week. And I thought Mystic uh, Dan was, should have been in the mix. So I used him and it worked out well. Well, good for you. From back in Louisville, here's a man who you got to know so well when he was the longtime TV analyst for Churchill Downs. He's a longer-time handicapper, more recently known for his popular fair odds at horseracingnation.com. Lower right, 39th appearance on the pod. Here's Ed DeRosa. 39th? Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> well, happy to be on. And uh, it wasn't a total disaster for me. I definitely sense... Johnny did a little better than I did, uh, but, you know, I was bullish on Forever Young, and I thought he ran his race, so I certainly wasn't embarrassed, but I'd much rather have a higher balance than a lack of embarrassment, so we'll try harder this time. Also in Louisville, one of the founders of Derby Wars and of Horse Racing Nation. He has worked in all facets of racing, from race course management and administration to the development of cutting edge handicapping tools that we talk about a lot here and that you can find at horseracingnation.com making his 28th appearance on the rfrp mark midland all right 28 i gotta pick up the pace to keep keep up with these guys <laughs> well I'll, derby di was I'll die mark and then you can catch me oh, <laughs> don't do that don't it's a little dark to start the pod but uh, yeah, Derby was a total death for me, but uh, had a great triple crown last year. So uh, looking to pick up in these next two legs. This is the 376th episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Uh, the first one that originates from Mount Clare, West Virginia, off I-79 near Clarksburg. Uh, we recorded Tuesday morning during a break in my drive between Kentucky and Maryland. Uh, guys, do you, you think I should actually start the engine and get on the highway and try to record this as we're moving along i mean you should have just run with mystic dan from louisville you have free free ride <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah i could have asked kenny mcpeak you know he owns the he owns the trucks and trailers i guess he could have authorized that well the scene may change but yeah. the object here is the same analyzing every horse in the race and we will take them in program order from one through nine we'll take the first part of the field first but uh let me first call your attention to the Preakness Stakes Challenge. Our friends at Express Bet have tied in with Saturday's card at Pimlico. And like all the contests this spring at Express Bet, it's a live money tournament. The buy in for this one $1,500, $1,000 for your bankroll, the other $500 for the prize pool. And the prize pool is estimated to hit $75,000 in cash. And it's not just the money. Express Bet is awarding seats. So some terrific tournaments, the California Crown Betting Championship in September for the advent of 
that new racing package that will be at Santa Anita, the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge in November at Del Mar, the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship in January at Gulfstream Park, and of course the big one, the National Horse Players Championship in March in Las Vegas. This weekend's entry window doesn't close until the seventh race Saturday at Pimlico, so you have time to check out the details. I, I'm not going to say, do it now. Well, maybe I'll whisper, do it now, because if you do it now, you don't forget. You can get in on the beginning of the card. You don't have to worry. Early start on uh, Saturday, too, the 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Go to expressbet.com slash tournaments. That's where you'll find the FAQ and the sign-up page. That's X-P-R-E-S-S-B-E-T dot com slash tournaments. Leave off the first E when you get involved in the Preakness Stakes Challenge at expressbet.com slash tournaments. This is the Preakness Hardcore Handicappers episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod, available on all podcast platforms and as of midweek on YouTube in video form on the Horse Racing Nation page. If you're consuming it one way and prefer the other, well, the choice is yours. And I should add, past performances heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran Speed Points, the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself and get full Preakness card PPs now at brisnet.com. With Johnny Avello, Mark Midland, and Ed DeRosa, let's take a look at the Preakness Stakes. $2 million, a mile and three sixteenths, three-year-olds, 126 pounds. Those conditions haven't changed. Uh, post time around 7 o'clock Eastern time, depending on post time lag, program time, NBC, etc. cetera. <laughs> Uh, here's the latest on the weather as we were hearing about it Tuesday, and it's been ever-changing. We were hearing about certain rain, but now the National Weather Service in Baltimore and Washington says 60% chance of showers. Okay, mainly before 8 a.m. Eastern time. If that holds, then we're probably looking at a fast track and maybe a tight track on Saturday, but know that rain is in the forecast, so there could be some ifs high near 76 degrees, and let's take these horses in the order that they are in the program. Number one, Mugatu, was a scratch from the Kentucky Derby because was the last also eligible. Could have gotten in, but did not. Uh, this is uh, a Colt by Blofeld. Jeff Engler training in his first Preakness Stakes. Joe Bravo will be in his fifth. He's never hit the board in any of his rides. Best Daily racing form buyer speed figure of 87, best Briz figure of 93. This is a maiden winner who was fifth in the Arkansas Derby, and that was in his 12th start. Broke his maiden on his fifth try in November on the Gulfstream Park Tapita. 20 to 1 on the morning line, 25 to 1 in Las Vegas in the futures betting that has reopened after the draw. So that's the setup for Mugatu. Uh, Looks like one of the two longest shots on the board, Johnny. Uh, are you even including him on your tickets? Well, let's just kick this off with who I consider the least likely to win this race. Uh, he's owned by the average Joe Racing Stables, and I'm not even sure I would call this horse your average Joe. Uh, his entire performance line just looks really poor, Ronnie. If if there's any positive things I can say about Mugatu is uh, they, they, they're they two. He won his only race when he was ridden by Joe Bravo, and that was on synthetic. And he finished fifth to Sierra Leone only by seven lengths. So two good points, but uh, he's, not, he's not in the mix for me at all. Ed? Yeah, I, I agree with Johnny, least likely winner for sure. And, you know, unfortunately, these races are few and far between uh, at this level where, you know, when my fair odds come out, you'll see I have them at plus 100 to 1. Uh, and he's going to be, I mean, they made him 20, I guess, maybe. But, I mean, even if he's 30 or 40, that's a tremendous underlay, uh, which, you know, creates opportunity elsewhere and it adds up. So, Glad he's in. You know, I wish others would take a shot at sporting. I mean, the fifth in the bluegrass isn't totally awful. And if you're in a gambling mood, maybe he's the type you you play around with the horses you really like and key him in fourth or fifth in the super, super high five. 
because uh, that you know could help a little bit, but I give him no chance to hit the board. Okay, Mark. Well, minimal chance. Okay, minimal, minimal as in none. <laughs> minimal as in yeah, tenths of a percent. Um, yeah, I'm with the guys. I, I think this is the biggest long shot in the race. Uh, I I would say no chance to hit the board at all. Um, I I do play the superfecta a lot. I I even have a hard time him get hitting the superfecta. I will take a look at him for the super high five. Um, the super high five is normally a really tough bet, but we've got a couple big favorites in here. And uh, the thing about the super five, high five is it's almost a math game. So there's nine horses in the race. The th- th- nice thing about a closure like this at the end is it tends not to run ninth because they run at the end. And let's say if the two Lucas's horses stop and he runs by uncle heavy, that puts him already in sixth and he just needs to be one of the top five favorites to get fifth. And uh, it goes back to the super, uh, the odds like Ed's talking about, he could be 25 to one, but he could be 55. To one. And if 50, 45, 55 to one, I think he will help the super high five. And, uh, and, and I would dabble with keying a horse like this where you're looking at a pretty big ticket, but okay. not a use at all in the top three. And I'm not going to use in the top four. But okay. I wouldn't blame somebody. Okay. Treading water to get onto Mark's ticket, not anywhere near for Johnny and Ed and for me. Number two, Uncle Heavy. He is trained by Butch Reed, who will be in his first Preakness. This social inclusion cult will be ridden by Erod Ortiz Jr. This will be his sixth Preakness stakes. He's had a couple of second place finishes. This is a horse who was fifth by 11 lengths in the Wood Memorial. Did win the Withers on a muddy, sealed track at Aqueduct. Won a state-bred stakes at Parks in the slop in December. So two for two on wet tracks. Maybe you bear that in mind if the track does come up wet uh, in the Preakness at Pimlico on Saturday. 20 to 1 morning line, 25 to 1 in a Vegas Futures book. And that is the number two Uncle Heavy. Ed, let's start with you. Well, uh, the thought that they're both 25 makes me interested to see if the head-to-head shows up uh because even as i don't like uncle heavy to win the race i think i'll have him 90 100 to one in my fair odds uh that's still 50 percent more likely than i'll have mugatu so you know if they're the same price uh that actually is kind of opportunity somehow on uncle heavy and you know mark's point about closers uh fits here as well uh you know with ortiz up you're, you're going to get your shot. Like he's going to come running at the end. Maybe that can get fourth or fifth. Anything better than that seems unlikely. I mean, the, the wooden Memorial just kind of fell apart around him with the two favorites being bad. And there was a breakdown. And uh, so if you draw a line through that, he fits underneath uh, at a big, big, big price. Uh, I really wish we had props. I mean, we, we desperately need Johnny to be able to draw up some lines for, <laughs> for these big races. Cause I I'd love to get a head to head on him and we got to assuming bookmakers thought they were, you know, equally likely because uncle heavy is clearly more likely. Unfortunately, that still only makes him at best fourth. I think Mark. Yeah, I just have a hard time getting uh, excited about this horse. Uh, I think he's overmatched. And, uh, you know, the top, I would say, five horses um, have got this horse by quite a bit. So I don't really have a lot of interest to to Ed's point. Um, I mean, this horse is a little bit better. He's definitely better than Mugatu. Uh, we'll have to see how the prices shake out. You know, do you want to goof around with a fourth or fifth? Maybe, but that's, I think, a little bit more gambling. I should point out, best buyer of 84, best Briz uh, rating of 94. Johnny? Uh, three wins and five tries, but this is so slow. Um, yep. There's a couple of points that keep me saying that he's the second least likely to win. Uh, I don't particularly like him, but I, I have less. Less negativity because he's two, two for two on a wet track, and that's always a possibility. But from what you're saying, maybe not so much. Yeah, and he's got the services of Ortiz. And although Michael Sanchez is a decent rider, Ortiz is just a huge upgrade. So um, one thing you just said, Ronnie, which is kind of interesting to me, is it doesn't seem like Irad gets good mounts for Triple Crown races. I mean, 
you go to any big race day anywhere around the country and he's sitting on 10 horses with six that are probably have a good chance to win. But for some reason, in these triple crown races, he just doesn't seem to get the, you know, the horses from from the uh, trainers who normally give him, you know, huge chances. So I'm kind of surprised at his record so far in triple crown races. Um, back to this horse, this one, um, you know, maybe three or third in a try, fourth in a super. But I'm not I'm not going to partake in supers for this race. So probably not going to use this horse, probably not going to have him anywhere. The only way I will, and I will, is if it's a gully washer on the day and the track ends up becoming mm-hmm. more of a lake than it does a dirt surface. And I would use him in that case, but uh, he's going to be coming from off the pace, which could be a problem against a better uh, field than he faced, certainly in a state bred race at parks or even in the withers. So I will do that with some caution and maybe uh, underneath. Number three, I think we're going to finally get somewhere where we might uh, have someone who could fall onto a ticket here. And he fell into the Preakness because it wasn't until Monday that Brad Cox said, yes, catching freedom, deep closer will be coming in after uh, closing from 15th to finish fourth in the Kentucky Derby after the early pace breakdown. Won the Louisiana Derby before that, was third in the slop in the uh, Risen Star and looked like he was going to contend until the late rush of Sierra Leone to win that race. This is a Constitution colt trained by Brad, who's in his third Preakness, has a second and a third in his first two, uh, at least in terms of the horses he has had in them. Flavian Pratt will be in his uh, second Preakness. He won his first, and he uh, is going to be on a horse who has a best buyer of 97, a best Briz rating of 100, six to one morning line, six and a half to one. Uh, in Las Vegas. And by the way, the odds being quoted uh, in Las Vegas, uh, we're quoting from Caesar's Sportsbook, the only one that had anything posted, at least as of Monday night. Uh, Johnny, why don't you start with Catching Freedom? Okay. When, when I surveyed the entire entirety of the three-year-old crop this year, I realized no horse is marvelous yeah, uh, just yet because they're, you know, they could be. In Catching Freedom's Derby was, you know, it, it was pretty darn good. He finished fourth, only one and three quarter lengths behind the winner, Mystic Dan, and he ran a hell of a race. He was 15th after the first turn, and then he followed the winner up the rail. And the difference was is that Mystic Dan took the lead from the inside position, but he was actually losing ground, whereas Catching Freedom was actually stride for stride with Sierra Leone and, and uh, Forever Young. But the inside is no place to be when you're trying to make up ground and coming down a stretch at Churchill. Um, so in this race, he needs to be much closer. And one thing that worries me about these three-year-olds is that two races in a, in a short span like this, so being so close together, what did that derby race take out of him? Uh, and so that's a concern for me with this horse, but he's a horse... I need to certainly use, um, but he is not my top choice. Ed? I'm really int- intrigued and confounded by what to do with Catching Freedom. As a Brisnet user, uh, as I am, and we are at HRN, free PPs available, uh, he's the top-ranked prime power horse, so that caught my eye. And he is the only horse in this field, uh, if you look at the last two races of all the entrants, that has a triple digit first net speed rating. Now there are some other uh, proprietary figures I use where a horse we'll soon talk about is faster than catching freedom, but nevertheless, th- that triple digit and being the only one to do it in either of the last two starts, including the Derby uh, speaks to me. I think Johnny nailed the trip perfectly. I'd like to see him closer, but I look at these pace ratings and I just don't see how that happens. But Pratt stays loyal. I'd love to know what he said to Brad after the Derby. Uh, this is an unconventional move. Uh, tell me, oh, the owners wanted to go, then it's easier to toss him. But if Brad and Flavian were excited, he's a player. I want a little bit more than six to one. But in terms of a key of a horse who's going to be running, if he's the third, fourth, fifth choice, uh, Maybe just invade him underneath. Uh, I think he's going to be worth the price that he runs a better rate than we saw in the Derby. Mark? Yeah, I, I 
pretty much agree with the guys that this is a a, a horse that, that fits. he's not one of my top two choices but you're getting six to one um you know so i'm definitely going to use him prominently in, in second and third and uh you know i mean the way i kind of look at it, mystic dan rode the rail catching freedom rode the rail so they kind of got pretty good trips in the derby uh so we might have seen a little bit of their best um at least here you get six to one versus mystic dan at five to two so you're getting a little bit more price um you know and there's some positives and the horse is running from the derby coming back in the preakness in two weeks even though the trainers have kind of balked at it lately those horses run well uh horses coming back in two weeks from the mile and a quarter do run well at the preakness so I, I think you've got to include this horse up and down and and like ed said i'm i'm definitely intrigued on this horse and uh i've got a couple others that i like better but he'd be my third choice he'll be one, one thing I, yeah, i'm sorry ed go ahead now, uh, you know, we, we, uh, until we were blue in the face, we all talked about fiercenesses in and out pattern and catching freedom as the same one. And I, I think maybe we overlook it because he's a closer and you say, oh, he's at the mercy of the pace and he needs the right trip. Whereas fierceness just goes to the front and blitzes you when he's on. Uh, but it is interesting to me, like after, you know, two fierceness in and out, I look at catching freedom's lines and I see the same thing. Win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. Maybe this is the win at a at a nice number. I'm gonna That's look a good at point. And you know, the owners are wanting to I think the owners wanting to run is a piece of this, um, but that's not always a negative, and maybe they're seeing you know that pattern as well. I'm gonna use this horse if the track is playing fair and not speed biased. And by the way, let me let's uh, do our annual disabuse you of the tight turns speed biased <laughs> Pimlico thing. Uh, if there's a speed bias, it's on a day-to-day -day basis, not forever. And the turns are no tighter than Churchill. So disabuse yourself of that. Uh, I will look at the tote board and I will look at the track on the day. And that's uh, that will have a lot to say about whether I play uh, that said horse. Uh, number four is the favorite. And it is not the Kentucky Derby winner. And that would be Muth coming in for Bob Baffert. <laughs> Uh, the good magic colt who cost two million dollars for Zidane Racing Stable. Juan Hernandez will be riding in his first Preakness. Best buyer of 98. Best Briz rating of 105. Won the Arkansas Derby over two of the horses in this field. Just Steele and Mystic Dan. Won the San Vicente before that. Was second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. A distant second to Fierceness. And won the American Pharaoh to give him a grade one victory before he even had the Arkansas Derby win. Favorites have won 73 of the first 149 Preaknesses. And you're, wait, wait, this is Preakness 149. Uh, they were in divisions in 1918. So that's the extra number. <clears throat> but they've lost the last five. Something of note there. Eight to five morning line. Eight to five best price in Vegas, or only price right now in Vegas. Ed, let's start with you on Muth. Uh I mean, most likely winner. Uh, I struggled with the fair odds. I had anywhere from six to five to right on the morning line at eight to five. Uh, I mean, it just checks every box. He's the fastest horse on Ragazin, uh, which is the, the number I trust the most. And he won the prep that the Derby winner came out of. So, you know, form held up. And you get Bob Baffert, who's won the race eight times on seven weeks rest uh, against, you know, the, the better – half of the better of these are coming off two weeks rest. So he's the horse to beat. Uh, if the public goes wild and he's odds on, I will have to look elsewhere, but in terms of the multi-race wagers, uh, you know, my money's going to get in and hopefully at eight to five, you know, they bet it like the morning line. He's a single for me in that regard. And then we'll assess when we get to the race itself, but uh, there, everything about form analysis and, the way horses are coming into the race tells me he's going to move forward off the Arkansas Derby. And if he does, another horse in here would have to run their absolute best race of their life to even contend, let alone beat him. So he's my play at anything over even money. Johnny? Uh, certainly has the class. After breaking his maiden in his first race, every race since then, it's a grade one, grade two, grade three. And then the other jockey, Hernandez Juan, you know, where there's a couple Hernandezes in here, and one had <laughs> certainly had success last week. He's a top mm. 10 guy as a jock, and he's won at over 22% in the last couple of years. 
Uh, but he does get better mounts in California now where he's considered one of the top riders. What I do like about a horse like this is that he can be in first, second, or third. He's not going to be any worse than that at any point during the race. And he's never been worse than second heading for home. Uh, he's a better horse since losing the fierceness and the juvenile. And he's going to be extremely tough in this spot. Um, he's He's got to be your your top contender if if he's got to be one of your two top contenders for sure seems like a horse who's awfully tough whether he's on the racetrack or to leave off a ticket mark how about you yeah he's awfully tough uh like the guy said lots of positives here he he does look like he's he's working even better coming into the race even better so a, a step forward from the arkansas derby the only negative i could even find on him is i just thought with the two lucas horses here they both have some speed. There's not like a clear, clear pace horse. I could see one of the Lucas horses maybe running off a little bit like Just Steel tried to do in the Derby. Maybe that creates some problems for Muth. But like Johnny said, this is a horse that doesn't need to lead. He doesn't, he could sit for a second or third. So um, not many negatives. Like Ed said, got to use him as a, as a key player in the horizontal wagers. And uh, I'm going to try to beat him. So I'm going to make him my second choice, but uh, a big, big player here. All right. Uh, I, I, I'm going to look at the Baffert package as a whole, and I don't just mean imagination in this race, but I also mean Nisus because this was supposed to be Nisus's race. If he hadn't had his setback this winter, now we seem to be pumping up the consolation prize. And for that reason, uh, you know, eight to five. Yeah, I get it. I get that that look eight to five could be an overlay. Even money could be an overlay. I, I want to look elsewhere. I am not going to get sucked into the vortex of Muth the way I got sucked into the vortex of fierceness. Doesn't mean I'm not going to use him. Doesn't mean I'm not going to have him in a box. I just don't know that he's going to be my key horse. So um, then again, if I'm spreading or if I'm uh, if I'm going horizontal, I am going to spread and include him. I'm just, I'm just saying I'm not sold that he's definitely the one. And I would say the same thing about Mystic Dan. Uh, he won the Kentucky Derby, the Colt by Golden Sense, trained by Kenny McPeak, who is uh, one for seven in the Preakness, having won it with Swiss Skydiver in the COVID year of 2020, doing so with the Philly. Has a couple third-place finishes in there as well. Brian Hernandez Jr. will be riding in his fifth Preakness, has a third to his credit. Byer and Briss, coincidentally, best for Mystic Dan, a 101. Uh, of course, before winning the Kentucky Derby, was third in the Arkansas Derby to Muth and Just Steele. Won the Southwest note in the mud by eight. That was a big talking point going into the Derby when the weather forecast suggested it might be wet that day when it turned out not to be. Well, okay, still won it. Uh, so you have Mystic Dan at five to two on the morning line as the second favorite. First Derby winner to come into the Preakness and not be favored since 2012 when that was Al Have Another and Bodie Meister he looked like a hot second who might have flukishly finished runner-up in the Derby, but uh, that was the same result they had in the Preakness. Bodie Meister was trained by Bob Baffert. So here we are again, a lot of deja vu there. Uh, you're looking at plus 275 uh, or two and three quarters to one in Las Vegas best price. Johnny, let's start with you. Well, it was a great setup in the Derby and, and great ride. And, and uh, you know, and to be honest, I wasn't shocked when he won. Uh, I, I tell you, I used him in exact as it worked out fairly well, but Forever Young, of course, would have been much better for me. And to be honest, I thought Forever Young ran the best derby race. I thought he was the best horse that day, and he wins the race if he doesn't get bumped by Sierra Leone coming down a stretch. But that's what happens when you have a 20-horse field, and you see this every derby. There's always going to be stories on how your horse didn't get a clean trip. Um, if he wins this race... It won't be up the rail because I don't see any horse in this race who will have the lead like a track phantom and then be out of gas at the head of the stretch and just part the seas. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't circle and win, win it uh, a different way. One thing about horses that are winner that learn how to win. And if Dan mystic Dan now is a winner and the horse feels he can win, he comes back and he, you know, they, he feels like he wants to win uh, each and every race. And, uh, you know, horses kind of, that's the way they react sometimes to being winners. 
And so Mystic Dan at five to two after being whatever he was, 17, 18 to one is really short. Um, so that that's what I have a tough time uh absorbing is that the price is just way too short at four four to one or so would make more sense to me to use them how about for you mark yeah i mean he fits but uh you know i like others a little better here i feel like he kind of got the dream trip up the rail um you, you know I, I like we talked about with catching freedom has a lot of positives so i'm kind of looking at those horses a little bit the, the same way, but really hoping Catching Freedom outruns them because you're going to get a much better price on, on Catching Freedom. So, um, I mean, I kind of feel like if you missed the Derby, you don't you don't want to get uh, jump in here too late. Um, so, you know, I use them in third, uh, mostly, maybe a little bit in second, and uh, look for some of the others to turn the tables on Saturday. All right, Ed, how about you? Yeah, he's he's just too short. Um... You know, if you love him, it's a good scenario for you because Moot's going to be the favorite. And he's going to attract money, maybe a couple others. Uh, so you're you're getting a better price than, you know, like a California Chrome type year where the, the favorite comes in and is gangbusters. But, I mean, you guys said it, five to two after 18 to one. Um, it's just a huge drop in price. And, you know, the, the reality is the numbers certainly aren't better than Moot. And they're only right there with the rest. So uh, you're you're taking a clear second choice against horses who, based on numbers, are just as good. Now, he won the Derby and can't take that away from him. But from a gambling standpoint, I wouldn't be shocked if he runs well here and if that running well is good enough to hit the board. But from an odd standpoint, I have to play against. Yeah, I, I'm totally tote board watching on this. And I'm not optimistic we're going to get a better price than what we're seeing in the morning line or even in Las Agreed. Vegas at the plus 275. If we don't, I'm backing away. I'm backing away. And, and I can't forget, Johnny, you mentioned it, 18 to 1 in the Derby, and now suddenly he's this in the Preakness. So, okay, uh, not but not necessarily true. Mark, yeah? We should we should just add, you know, congrats to Kenny. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, win in the Derby. John Johnny, great adjustment to, to use him in, in cash there. And, and congrats to anybody that had this horse for the Derby. Um, really great handicapping. And I just wanted to add, if he did win the Preakness, that would be amazing for the sport. So uh, thanks for the owners and, and for Kenny to, to give it a shot here. And uh, it's what we need. This, this It really makes an exciting race. Yeah, the Absolutely. Gassaways who own the, who own the horse, who have been terrific dealing with. And Kenny's great with the media. Brian Hernandez, great with the media. And... Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, Kenny's going to be on uh, the Tony Kornheiser show podcast on Thursday. I wonder, wonder how that happened. Uh, Mark, you were talking about handicapping. So before we get to horses six through nine in the Preakness field, we'll go over those one by one. Let's go ahead and take our uh, halfway break or our five ninths break and talk about product that you can find at picks.horseracingnation.com. What do you have for us this week? Well, obviously the, the Kentucky Derby Preakness screen. I'm sorry, Kentucky Derby. The Preakness Super Screener uh, is the the follow up to the Kentucky Derby Super Screener, and uh, Mike Shelley does an awesome job on the Triple Crown, the Breeders' Cup, and the Super Screeners. Really, kind of looking at the patterns of what works. Um, really like the way he's analyzed this race, and uh, so I think that's a it's a great weapon in your arsenal if you want to cash big on Preakness. Uh, there's a lot of great recommended wagers in the Preakness Super Screener. And then from a day-to-day -day perspective, just, you know, one of the favorites Ed and I always look at is uh, the first-timer power rating report and uh, rates every first-timer between one and five stars. Comes up with some amazing plays. Uh, there was the 44-1 to one shot. We had a Keeneland, the Queens MG, uh, where uh, two uh, five-star long shots ran one-two. Uh, had a four-star just on Saturday at uh, uh, Gulfstream on 44 to one run second in the turf stake and uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, plays coming from that. And, and first timers are just, you know, it's so tough for handicappers. You don't have any speed figures. You don't have that something that where they've run before. So the first time power ratings give you that rating between one and five stars. And we show you what the winning percentage for each of the stars are. So uh, really great tool. 
And let me go back to the super screener for a moment because we had Mike Shuddy on the podcast on Friday, still available for you if you want to get some of his early hints on the Preakness. But if you want to get the super screener now, let me urge you to go to picks.horseracingnation.com. Click in the top left where it says super screener Preakness and Belmont stakes, open that. And you'll see some bonus tools we're throwing into the mix too. Horse Racing Nation, Power Picks, Horses to Single Report. Mark's mentioned some good tools. I'm throwing some at you here. Suffice it to say, this is like a veritable smorgasbord of handicapping tools that you find at picks.horseracingnation.com. And when you go to that super screener package, you're going to find a big savings for you if you do it now. Yeah, do it now because, uh, you know, you never know how long this price is going to last. Mark might know, but I don't know. He doesn't even tell me. So why don't you find out for yourself? Go to picks.horseracingnation.com. We talked about that big variety of tools, but let me go ahead and tell you, check out that super screener package. I think you'll be uh, pleasantly aware of a a nice price for you uh, that hopefully will bring you some nice prices in betting. The super screener and all the tools only at picks.horseracingnation.com. Picks, P-I-C-K-S, picks.horseracingnation.com. Before we get to horses six through nine in the 149th Preakness, let's learn more about DK Horse from Johnny Avello. Well, thank you for allowing me to, uh, you know, advertise our product a little. Um, you know, it's D- DK Horse has been in existence over a year now. It's a separate app that you have to download, at least for now. That'll change in a short period of time. But you can use your DraftKings credentials if you have the regular DraftKings uh, on, on, that you use for the regular DraftKings site to log in. So it, it is a single sign-on, but you still have to download it and, and fund the, uh, the additional app. Uh, we have a deposit bonus. We've been running that for quite some time now, 100% deposit bonus, up to $250. Just got to play through $250 twice. And for this weekend at Pimlico, uh, on Friday, you'll be eligible. All races, if your horse runs second or third, you bet make a win bet, you get up to $10 back. Same for Saturday. Uh, bet $25 on the Black Eyed Susan, get $5. Bet 150 on a Preakness Stakes, get $25. So we're running some new specials for this weekend. And the Derby was just a killer weekend for us, uh, our best by far in our short existence. But uh, looking for bigger things to come. And as you guys mentioned, uh, matchups, fixed odds, just something that just chomping at the bit to be able to do. Yeah, I was showing you, if you were watching on YouTube uh, or on X uh, for our video version of the hardcore here, uh, the DK Horse app. No, ignore the Cricket Australia that was next to it. It's DK Horse. So check that out. <laughs> Wherever you find your favorite apps in your favorite app store, whether it's the Play Store at Google, whether it's the apps through your Apple iPhone, look for it. DK Horse, if you're looking to play the horses through DraftKings. Ron Flatter, Johnny Avello, Ed DeRosa, Mark Midland. It's the Hardcore Handicappers edition of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Let's get to horses six through nine in the field, and we'll go to uh, the first of two Wayne Lucas horses who are lined up next to each other. Number six is Seize the Gray by Arrowgate. Uh, Jaime Torres is riding in his first Preakness. Uh, This horse won the Pat Day Mile, so we're talking about another horse coming back after only two weeks. That was on the Derby undercard. Did so at nine to one odds that day. Was seventh in the Bluegrass before that, third in the Jeff Ruby Stakes on Tapita, before that, yeah, uh, this is a case where Wayne loves to run his horses, and he's doing so again <laughs> here. Uh, 47th horse, 47th and 48th horses that Wayne will have had in the Preakness Stakes has six wins, two seconds, five thirds. Most recent winner was Oxbow. And you got 15 to one morning line, 18 to one in Las Vegas. Mark, what do you think of Seize the Gray? I thought he ran a nice race in the Pat Day Mile. It was a great uh, nine to one play. Um, you know, I just think he's a little light on speed figures. He's got to go further here. And uh, he kind of, you know, went out to the lead and then just kind of, uh, or not went to the lead. He tracked the pace, tracked a hot pace the whole time and just kind of let everything wilt around him. Uh, not really sure that works here. So I, I, I'm kind of out on Seize the Gray. You know, he has to go one more turn, one and a half more furlongs 
in this one. Best buyer, 88. Best frizz, 92. Johnny? Uh, Ron, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the fixed odds in town in Las Vegas. And, I, you know, I appreciate that the guys put them up, but they put them up after the morning line has been drawn and they stay right around that area. So right. I'd like to see them put up the Preakness before the morning line goes up and use their opinion a little more and therefore there'd be a little bit more value in it. 18 to one certainly is no good price here. <laughs> um, sees the gray. Uh, you know, he wanted a shot to get in the Derby field. So he took the safe for route and took the Pat day and he won at a pretty nice price. And this is a great story for the media on race day with the owners of my racehorse where multiple people can say I own Seize the Gray. I've had a lot of people come up to me and tell me I own this horse and they own like got a hundred bucks in it, which is great. Um, now Jamie Torres has a lot of success as an exercise rider and breezing horses and had a pretty fair showing in his apprenticeship at Naira Circuit. But even though he won his first grade two in the pet day, this is a big ass for him. And when I look at the horse, yes, the last race was pretty good, but Overall, the horse is just too slow. So this is not one of the – Lucas has two horses. This is not one that I'm considering using. Ed? Yeah, th this might actually be the biggest underlay of the race, uh, not because he's the least likely winner, but depending on how little Magatu's bet, uh, he might be closer to my fair odds and sees the ground. I mean, 15 to 1 is ridiculous. Uh, I remember around 90. Uh, I'm not a huge class guy. I, I, my mantra is typically speed is class. But you look at Seize the Gray's running lines and, you know, West Saratoga and Endlessly Nowhere, hopelessly beaten in the bluegrass. Uh, Nash was not ready for prime time throughout the spring. I mean, it's great that he won, but as Johnny noted, he didn't do it very fast. Uh, it's just really hard to like this horse. And, you know, Mark, we opened kind of talking about the super high five. I mean, he's a horse. If he's really 15 or 20 to one, which, you know, sounds like a long shot, but I'm just going to eliminate him altogether. He's right. There is no spot in the exotics where he's not going to be over bet. So he's, he's actually my only total complete toss of the race. Magatu can finish fifth and maybe I hit it. He's the gray. If he's in the number, I'm out. Yeah, agree completely. As do I. I, I will uh, not have one penny of my money on Seize the Gray. Will you put any money on the other Lucas then? Number seven, Just Steel, was 17th in the Derby in his 12th start. He was second in the Arkansas Derby to Muth, and uh, he had five, or has actually had, five losses in a row since his sprint stakes win at Churchill Downs back in November. Wayne Lucas, of course, training. Joel Rosario, 0 for 9 in the Preakness, does have four runner-up finishes and a third. Best buyer of 95, best Briss of 97. 15 to 1, both on the morning line and at Caesars in Las Vegas. Johnny? Boy, it is a tough horse to figure out. He's nice breeding, and but just so inconsistent. And the main cause is that he tends to find trouble in a race. If it's not trouble, he maybe just doesn't feel like participating on certain days. I, I don't know. If if I throw out the Kentucky Derby, the Rebel, the Breeders' Futurity, and the Hopeful, I can make a case for him. So <laughs> I've been burned by, by Lucas so many times since – how old is Lucas, by the way? Is he 88? 88. 88. 88. So I've been burned. I've been burned by Lucas probably over the last five years or so, where he has he has been able to sneak in and split me. So I think I have to use this horse somewhere, just as the race falls apart, where Rosario finds a way to to get him in the second position. Ed. Yeah, I was pretty chilly to this one last week. Uh, some other handicappers I respect warmed me up a little bit. And, you know, this is another case. He's 15 to 1, along with his uncoupled stable mate. You know, if we were looking at a head-to-head -head opportunity, I mean, Just Steel, to me, is is absolutely the, the preferred portion. Uh, close to the pace. Uh, I actually think I like Keith Asmussen as a writer a lot better than others. I, I've seen a lot of criticism. 
but it's hard to deny that this isn't an upgrade to Rosario, uh, even with the winless mark at the Preakness. Uh, so, yeah, there's some things to like. And I'd say that the biggest thing for me, hanging my hat on upgrading this horse in my mind, is his Ragazin figure in the Arkansas Derby is among the fastest in this group. And normally, a big step backward in the Derby, I would say, well, he's going the wrong way. Time to, you know, tab him for later in the year. But as Johnny noted, it's Lucas. And, you know, he pulls a cat thief out of his hat once a generation. So maybe this is it. I can't completely toss him. Uh, you know, I don't love him, but I'm going to watch the tote board for my final determination. But he's in the mix for me, at least underneath. It was Oxbow, what, 11 years ago, I think. So uh, that was the last time uh, that Wayne Lucas won a, a triple crown race. Mark? Yeah, and Oxbow was on the lead, too. And uh, and as Johnny said, that was one of the ones of uh, Lucas where I, that burned me. And uh, I don't think it was once in a generation. Ed. He, he he does pop quite a bit, you know, here and there. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm intrigued by this horse for a couple of different ways. Uh, not really to win. Um, but I think without a clear speed horse here, uh, as I said, Lucas has got two, um, even though it was a kind of a failure in the Derby, uh, I think that this horse kind of didn't break well. There was a big bunch of, of horses on the inside, sort of like the 10 through the four that all slammed each other. And Keith Asmussen kind of rushed him up and maybe that's why he ran so poorly. Um, you know, would really wouldn't overthink the 17th by 33 in the Derby. At some point, he's just done and wrapped up on the horse. Um, so I guess the, to me, the, is there a play where this horse goes out in front of the Baffert horses, the Baffert horses let him go, and Muth sits off him and says, well, I can go buy him whenever. So, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of Preakness long shots run second. And so I think that would maybe be the play here is if the pace isn't that fast and he's out there, uh, we, we kind of see an in and out pattern with this horse. And as Ed said, he's got a big sheets number. Uh, he was wide in the Arkansas Derby. And then, you know, a little bit depends on price, but like think about Muth and the Arkansas Derby. So if Muth wins the Preakness, how dumb would you feel if Just Steele that ran second in the Arkansas <laughs> Derby to him ran second in the Preakness? So I, I would want to have that a little bit. Um, because of the, the good price, though, you don't have to go crazy. If he's, you know, 22 to 1, you can have him a little bit in the exacta, a little bit in the trifecta. You get some nice leverage on those those odds, and it uh, doesn't have to be your main play, but I do want to include him. Yeah, exotics underneath, however you want to say it. He of the Lucas pair is the one, I think, you look at. And even if you just look at him from a figure standpoint, that could be reason enough to do so, rather than with C's the gray. Talking, of course, then about Just Steele uh, for, I guess, for all of us, the preferred Lucas. Number eight, <laughs> Tuscan Gold, the most lightly raced horse in this field by Medallia Doro. Chad Brown, who has won twice recently in the Preakness, including two years ago with early voting, before that with cloud computing back in 2017, also has a second in his five times or five horses at least, in the Preakness. So pretty good strike rate. Tyler Gaffalione, 0 for 2, coming in. Of course, he was fined $2,500 for his ride on Sierra Leone, uh, going up against Forever Young. Uh, forever, that will be a debate, I suppose, as to why the inquiry light didn't go on. Be that as it may, different horse, different circumstance now. Three races for Tuscan Gold. To his name, he was third to Catching Freedom in the Louisiana Derby. Broke his maiden on his second try in January at Gulfstream Park. A 95 buyer, a 95 bris, and 8-1, to one, both on the morning line and in Las Vegas. Mark? Yeah, of course, uh, you know, great price. And uh, I think there's a lot of things that are pointing to this horse. Uh, the, the only thing it isn't is Muth, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, Chad Brown, as you said, he's done really well in the Preakness uh, with cloud computing. He won. Um, he won with early voting. Uh, Blazing Sevens, who wasn't really expected to be much, ran a good race in the Preakness uh, with a second, right, last year. And uh, yeah. this horse, uh, he's working right now. Working well. And free that Brown had... Uh, he had Sierra Leone, 
And then, you know, domestic product, I think some of the question in my mind was, why wouldn't domestic product go to the Preakness as much as the, the Preakness? I think policy and goals the region. And, and uh, you know, when we, uh, Horse Race and Nation, did the Preakness future wager lines for uh, for the Preakness. And so uh, Tuscan Gold has been kind of targeting the Preakness for a long time. This isn't like... A, I know they dabbled with an entry in the Peter Pan, but I think that was probably weather related or just kind of a look and see kind of thing. Um, but they've been pointed here for a long time. And then finally we have the Louisiana Derby. I mean, it's been such a, a key race, catching freedoms run well out of it. Um, you know, Autumn Marie had trouble in the Derby, but then we had uh, Antiquarian who uh, came back and he won uh, the Peter Pan impressively. So he was sixth in the Louisiana Derby had a similar trip to Tuscan Gold, very wide trip, and Antiquarian came back, figures jumped quite a bit. And I think we're going to see the same thing with Tuscan Gold. So uh, he's my top choice. I don't know exactly how he beats Smooth. I don't know if that's possible. And so what I would recommend betting-wise is if you get it like 70 to 1 on a horse like this, you could bet 50 to win on Tuscan Gold, and then you could take a, a, a 10 or a $20 exact to straight Smooth over Tuscan Gold sort of takes Muth out of the race betting wise. So you've got to just beat all the other horses. And so that's kind of how I'll play it. And I'll use this horse along with Muth and the horizontals. All right, Johnny. Uh, this is going to be a good one, uh, but is now the time. You know, he's late, lightly raced and he certainly has the right style for this one. Um, if he does not run well in this race, when I say not run well, he doesn't win or he finishes third, I think what happens is that Chad Brown moves him to the turf because he certainly has the breeding to do that also. I think this is where as long as he stays, stays healthy. His works have been pretty good and seamless over the last couple of months. He ran fourth to Sierra Leone that, in his debut back in November and we found trouble in that in that first time out. My my good my guess is that this horse is going to have interest at the betting windows, and he's not going to be eight to one. He's going to be more like five or six, and he's fresh and he's got a really big shot here. Now, one thing I will mention: there is a place in town right now that has him ten to one in the future book, and if I can get down there today, I will to make <laughs> that. Play. Yeah. Oh. I better look at my apps here and get myself up to date. Ed? Yeah, I like him. Uh, it's, I'm curious to see how he gets bet. I mean, Johnny threw out five to one, which, you know, that to me, that's too low. And then, it, then the question becomes, okay, well, now who's too high if they're betting Tuscan gold like that? But man, Chad is such a tactician. Uh, that second last year, I mean, Blazing Sevens. I think Tuscan Gold's a lot better. Uh, maybe this field's better too, uh, so he'll have to be better. But Chad getting that horse to be second and a good second, the National Treasure, uh, you know, and, and the two other wins, and you know, cl clearly this is a race he knows how to point to, uh, even so. Tuscan Gold, super dangerous. Uh, you know, I'd love to see Mystic Dan uh, get get bet a bunch because then I know Tuscan gold is going to be the right price underneath Muth. Uh, and then, you know, maybe we can sneak just steel in there, but he's a major player. And and I would say the, the primary threat to Muth. Yeah, I, I just found that app, Johnny um, Elvis has left the building. There's a clue. Uh, you know, don't go <laughs> East, go uh, gate. Um, yeah. Tuscan gold, 10 to one. I would take that all day. I love Tuscan gold here. I love Chad Brown. When he has a target, and he, it seems clear that he's made this the target. He's not taking a horse with only three races and putting him in here for batting practice. I, this, to me, is Chad Brown authoring a script, and it's coming up exactly how he wants it in a race that he knows how to win. With a horse, look, um, you know, look I get the catching freedom is – a bit of an anomaly and being third to him in the Louisiana Derby was something, but look, there's a horse that can come from off the pace might appreciate the distance against the same distance as the Louisiana Derby. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking hard, long and hard at Tuscan gold, which brings us to the ninth horse, the one drawn outside the other Baffer that's imagination. 
horse that could very well be the pace setter in this race. A million-dollar colt by Into Mischief. Frankie DeTore will get his first Preakness ride, looking to make his first flying leap at Pimlico. Baffert, uh, as we mentioned, eight for 25 in the Preakness with two runners up and two-thirds. A best buyer of 96, a best Briz of 97. This horse is two for six, had four seconds. In fact, uh, second by a neck to stronghold in the Santa Anita Derby, won the San Felipe. Uh, Baffert, 32% uh, coming back with a beaten favorite. Uh, which this horse was last out in the Santa Anita Derby. I should point this out. This century, this is a quirky little fact, the Kentucky Derby has spawned 16 Preakness winners. The race with the next most is the Santa Anita Derby with seven. Baffert's got not all of them. He's got <laughs> four. Uh, Michael McCarthy and uh, Keith DeSormo and Art Sherman have the other three. Six to one morning line, six to one looking down here, seven to one best price now in Las Vegas. Let's start with you, Ed. Certainly a gate to wire threat. And, you know, I, I hate to keep punting on waiting on a price, but, you know, at, at 10 to one, he becomes impossible to ignore because you know his path to victory. Uh, and that's the right price to gamble on it. Six to one, I'm, I'm a little less interested, but I see no reason why he's not going to run his race. Uh, I'm bearish on Into Mischief as a classic sire. I know he's had some success and he has the big stallion fee to go with it. And this horse cost a million, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's some brilliant, really good pedigrees in here. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if he can see it out for nine and a half furlongs, but he's going to get every shot to from the outside. I fully expect him to be on the lead under the wire the first time and into the first turn. And then we'll see what kind of magic Frankie can work and whether that means he ends up on the board or not, but certainly a major player based on run style. Uh, my pause is, you know, stronghold ran okay in the Derby. Wasn't great. Uh, wasn't terrible by any means, but uh, gosh, I, I wish I knew what the price is. What, what what are we seeing in Vegas again? Seven, seven to one now at the Westgate. Yeah, oh, I mean, McCoy, it's the Westgate. Okay, uh, I, I'm so bullish on Muth that you know, from a win standpoint, I, I I'm not going to use imagination at that short of a price, but uh, you know, certainly. If it's a bad exactor, try. Hopefully we, we get another price in there. He's a player, but uh, probably an underlay when all is said and done. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think Ed put it well. He's a player. We know his path is going, you know, going to the lead. Um, he's coming up to the race well. I, I do think the, the price is interesting. And, uh, you know, I think people might – overplay that stronghold didn't do great in the derby too much uh i think they're different races uh stronghold was trying to work out a trip from the 19 or 18 or whatever it was and and of course yeah. has potential to be on the lead um i think you like i saw, talked about just steel i think this is a horse that's potential to lead the whole way and hold on for, for second uh so i do want to cover that and you're just getting a, a better price than you know mystic dan or, or catching freedom so uh I, i'll use them from that reason reason and uh I, I guess i kind of wonder why he's in here but i guess baffert's got several owners and the horse is doing well so there's probably no reason for him not to be here yeah the sf racing group in this case uh johnny another of those baffert horses who is never worse than second or third you know heading for home the, you know when i think when i think about it baffert really doesn't have closers does he, he all his horses are no it seemed to be near the front. It's just midnight loot. Yeah, right. It's a long way back. Yeah. Well, this horse has been the chalk in in six, five of the six races he's been in. The only one was his maiden uh, race then at Del Mar, and he was a short price in that. So I guess the question in handicap in this race is how's Baffert going to play his hand here? He's got two horses that go out. I think he sends imagination to the front, and then Muth sits second. Uh, all the all this horse's races have been in California. All those workouts are in California. And is he going to like it away from home? It's another question. Now, not that the nine is a troubling post, especially in this race with only nine horses, but he may have to work to get to the lead because Tuscan Gold's probably going out, try to fit, get somewhere in third position or fourth. Just Steele, he may go out also to try to find a good stalking position. So, 
this horse may have to work a little bit harder to get the lead. It might not be an easy lead. So that could possibly compromise his chances for the win. But hey, he's he's a good horse. He's he's a starlight horse. Those guys know what they're doing. They certainly breed, they certainly buy a lot of really good horses and are won a lot of good races. So I think I use them somewhere. I just don't I don't use them heavily. I have a ticket somewhere. I love this horse. I love this horse. I love betting the other Baffert. That's the other thing. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's a little bit of the case of this one's underrated and Muth is overrated in my mind. Shame on me if that's what's influencing me. But I also look at some pretty strong speed ratings and figures and what have you. And so I'm going to be keying imagination. And uh, the, the key here is, like has been said, he's got to get out to the lead from the outside post. Really, the, the speed is outside in this race, unlike the Derby where it was really to the inside. So I'm going to be looking at imagination. But what is everyone looking at for a best bet on the Preakness? We're going to examine that before we get out of here. Uh, before I get you out of here, let me make sure you are paying attention to the Preakness Stakes Challenge that's being put on by First Racing, First Bet, and Express Bet. Our friends at Express Bet have been putting together some terrific live money tournaments this spring, uh, even going back to the winter as well. We've been telling you about them every week. And this one is really terrific from the standpoint that there will be $75,000 in cash, the estimated prize pool. It costs you $1,500 to get in. A thousand of that is your bankroll, your scorekeeping device, of course, as it is a live money tournament. The other $500 goes into the prize pool. And let me tell you, it's a five-digit first prize, depending on how many entries they get. Uh, it's, a, it's a chunk of change that would be on top of the bankroll that you're going to keep if you're winning. Uh, there are also seats to big tournaments coming up. The California Crown, the new racing feature that will be at Santa Anita in September, that betting championship is going to have some seats on the line in the Preakness Stakes Challenge. Same goes for the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, the Pegasus Championship, and the National Horse Players Championship. All of those with seats available. It's a great way for you to get involved and a pretty good price, too. It's a way that if you've already gotten your feet wet in tournaments and you really want to take the next step, this is the perfect one to do. The entry window doesn't close till the seventh race on Saturday at Pimlico, so you have time to check out the details. You'll probably want to get in earlier so you have some choice of what races you want to bet since it is a 14-race card. Uh, go to hmm. expressbet.com slash tournaments. All the questions you have can be answered there. And all the entry information you need to give can be filled in right there. You can pay your way in and be ready to go on Saturday for the Preakness Stakes Challenge. Remember to leave off the first E when you type it in. It's X-P-R-E-S-S-B-E-T dot com slash tournaments. And that's how you get in on the Preakness Stakes Challenge. This is the Hardcore Handicappers edition of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod for the Preakness. The regular episode of the RFRP will be posted as usual Friday morning. The episode from this past week featuring Caitlin Free, Brian Hernandez Jr., Super Screener creator Mike Shuddy, all looking back on the Kentucky Derby and ahead to the Preakness. And this Friday, I will be at Pimlico, where I'll catch up with you and connections coming into Saturday's race and also our... Uh, Oh, yes, the Paddock Prince. David Levitch will be along. He'll offer some insight into what he's thinking about when you get the Paddock Prince package. So wherever you get your podcast, Apple, your Firefox, your iHeart, your Spotify. Uh, now I sound like Jay Pritchett on Modern Families. Check out our uh, regular Friday episode of the RFRP. Uh, Ed and Mark, I want to make sure we get in one more hit on the tools at horseracingnation.com, uh, picks.horseracingnation.com. Uh, Ed, you want to take a, the first crack at this since uh, Mark got the first uh, lead off on the last one? Sure. Yeah, we, you mentioned uh, Paddock Prince, a uh, great compliment to the, the screener stuff. And with rain, maybe in the forecast, maybe not ever changing, uh, but definitely want to point people in the direction of our Sire Moves report, uh, which covers 
surfaces, surface switches, if applicable, uh, off tracks, if also applicable, uh, that's available as uh, part of uh, several packages of picks at horseracingnation.com, which uh, is so much more than picks because we do use all that data to analyze uh, pedigrees and races in different ways than uh, you'll ever get in any of the other past performance type products. And Sire moves definitely a favorite of mine, especially that Pimlock card on Saturday. Lots of turf sprints. Uh, if the rain comes, might be off the turf, might be an off main track. Invaluable information for, you know, sussing out which horses have the bloodlines to excel or, you know, just as powerful, maybe not perform as well as the PPs indicate in wet weather. So definitely check that out. And it's for every race day, not just Pimlico, but could come in handy this weekend for sure. I love it. Mark, I mean, I'm telling you, you, you got you got the lab code on. You're developing half of the stuff, aren't you? Yeah, and uh, Ed and I and our data team, we're, we're working on different ideas. And I think it, Ed kind of hit on the key is this is stuff that's not available anywhere else. So if right. you want an advantage, uh, getting first timers on sire moves, on, on finding some hot paces, slow pace things that uh, others may not have data on shipper shipper report you know the take a new meet like churchill downs how are the horses doing coming in from oakland from fairgrounds from Gulfstream, from keeneland uh the information is just invaluable so uh you can get those in our pro reports package and uh, data you don't really see anywhere else it's one place to find it all picks.horseracingnation.com p-i-c-k-s picks.horseracingnation.com Let's get final thoughts, especially best ways to play the Preakness coming up on Saturday, post time around 7 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, here's the knowledge from DK Horse in Las Vegas, Johnny Avello. Okay. Uh, the way I'll play this race is I, I won't play Muth as a big bet because uh, his price is a little short, but I will use him top and We'll reverse that and exact as I'll use both of those horses on top with just steel and imagination uh, in the second spot. And when I get, and I'm not going to play supers, as I said, but for tries, I'll use Muth, Tuscan Gold. Uh, I'll also use Mystic Dan and uh, Catching Freedom in the third spot, as well as uh, imagination. I think just steel is either going to be second or he's not going to be in the mix. That's the way I'm looking at it. So if I get burned, I don't mind getting burned on the truck. I don't want to get burned on the exact. All right. Find him on social media, particularly X at EJXD2. Find his fair odds frequently at horseracingnation.com. Find his best strategy for the Preakness now from Ed DeRosa. Well, uh, hopefully I won't have to make a win bet on Muth. He'll be a single for me in the multi-race wagers, uh, which – not sure what that will entail. I haven't looked at the preceding four races, uh, but certainly looking to to get in the mix uh, in the pick five and others. Uh, so he's he's a strong single there. I think the eight to five morning line uh, gets me on the right side of the price for that. Uh, in terms of betting the the Preakness itself, as I said, I, I mean, it, it sounds so disrespectful to toss the Derby winner, but it's the clear second choice against this group. Uh, the numbers just aren't there to to take five to two and then to take the horse who's going to be bet the most uh, other than Muth and all the spots. So it's a gamble. Uh, we all know he's capable of a big run and he's consistent, but uh, the price just isn't right at all. So Muth is is the key on top. And then, you know, we'll see how the betting shakes out. But I would say the, the longer of catching freedom or Tuscan gold uh, will be the one I'll, I'll more strongly key underneath Muth. And uh, as I've mentioned, he's uh, the one who's got his finger on the pulse of all of our tools at picks.horseracingnation.com. Uh, he is the man who uh, was involved in the creation of Derby Wars and Horse Racing Nation. And uh, he's done pretty good handicapping himself, Mark Midland. Um, yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with Tuscan Gold as uh, my top choice. And like I said, I'll back up. Uh, with Muth over him in an exacta. And, uh, you know, the one thing I did want to mention too about imagination is that horse hasn't really bent on a clear lead by himself. So I think the only way for me that Tuscan Gold loses is, is to one of the Bafferts, most likely Muth. 
um, but do a small cover under imagination. But my main play will be uh, kind of a four eight box, uh, exact a box, um, and then playing Tuscan Gold on top of the the three four seven nine. And uh, kind of like Johnny said, is touch just steel in second and third, but not not a whole lot. Just kind of he's kind of all or nothing from for as far as hitting the board. So you know if I can get Tuscan Gold over. Um, Muth and catching freedom in some order, second, third. That's something I want to have, and uh, I think we pay pay pair pretty well. For me, imagination, Tuscan gold, Muth and Uncle Heavy. I'll be playing them in that order, in that priority, and I might just box all of them. I, <laughs> I made a rather large mistake not doing the uh, full box on the Derby, so you know, fool me once. Well, you know how that goes. All right. And so uh, how does it go for you? Well, we've uh, given you all the advice. Hopefully, uh, you know, the Internet here in West Virginia, I know we may have been a little bit choppy. Hope you can forgive that. Hopefully the message got through to you. And hopefully I can uh, say the thank you clearly to Johnny Avello, Ed DeRosa and Mark Midland until we are back from Pimlico on Friday. From Mount Clare, West Virginia, I got to get back on I-79. This is Ron Flatter. I don't know what we are fighting for, but I know that they don't want us here. All right, gents, I got to go find power so I can try and uh, piece this together. <laughs> so thank you very much. Right, power to the people. Power Thanks, Johnny. Johnny. I'll, I'll, Ed, Thanks, I'll Johnny. send you the uh, Dropbox uh, thing and the do hick Very and all good. That. All right. Thank you, gents. All right. Bye. See you all. Good stuff.